So, Irvin, you're first. Oh, I saw this one, this example. Yeah, so Proctorio is, is suing people to, to shut up <laughs> about complaining that the whole thing is horrible. Uh, I find it kind of funny that this is what they're trying, this is, this is their way to shut up people. So when I, when I tweeted this, I'm like, no, no, don't shut up. Talk about it. And, and I think the point is they think it's secret how they tell that you're cheating by your eye movements or something. Right. Right. And they and think that if you like reveal that, then that will be easier for students to cheat. Right. But at this point they, they need to stop because this is insane. Well, you know, I remember, um, this is a big issue. Like I think it was in Japan or South Korea. They like actually put in anti-cheating on some all important test, and there was a huge strike and a rebellion because they have like this test you take at like age 14 that determines your whole life and people cheat like crazy. <laughs> it's yeah. I mean, I was always, I was so surprised to learn just how often people, for example, lie on their CV. Like I like I remember God, when, on my last job interview, people were like, "This is your CV." I was like, "Yeah, of course." I mean, it's and they looked shocked I wasn't lying. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I know. I remember when I got a job at a financial company. I was going to be the database engineer, and the boss pulled me aside. He said, "I just want you to understand that we don't salt the database by adding extra fake names so we can siphon off money." And I said, "Well, yeah." And he said, "Well, in case you were expecting that, I wanted you to know we weren't going to do that." And I said. Well, I would never do that. What are you talking about? <laughs> but apparently yeah. that is common. And yeah, yeah. common thought, enough. Yeah, he thought I might be in the habit of doing that. You know. <laughs> anyway, uh, all right. And then we got DSL. Okay. Oh, DSL phase out. Oops, I was doing the same thing. I'm yeah. killing, like be a good pirate here. Okay. Uh, there we go. Okay, there we go. Yes. Uh, so AT&T is phasing out their DSL internet access. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is primarily going to affect people in rural areas who depend on DSL and have no other option. Well, I thought uh, DSL only went like five or 10 miles to a major station anyway. So rural people couldn't get it anyway. Uh, well, they can. And some, for some people, this is their only option. Hmm. Uh, and I mean, you could possibly get like a satellite internet, but those are terrible. That's what like, yeah. yeah. Um, well, so our why, infrastructure. Uh, isn't this why Elon Musk is building his Starlink? That um, that's the next article I'm going to go over. Uh, yeah. So the two are, are interconnected. So, but but I first just wanted to start off with saying that uh, just pointing out that AT and T is pulling out because they want to focus their efforts on richer areas. So and they're just going to leave the poor people to fend for themselves. Well, that's what happens in, you know, a uh, uh, market driven thing. The yeah. unprofitable stuff just gets skipped. It's uh, it kind of makes sense. Yeah, so, for utility. so, uh, you know, this is kind of why you need like the government to provide an essential yeah. service to people that if it really isn't going to make money. Right. Uh, so the way it, it works is that you can't sign up for new DSL. Uh, but if you already have DSL, they're not going to cut you off right away. But this was really just out of the blue. Like they didn't announce this ahead of time. They're just like, nope, no more DSL. I remember Obama was going to have a huge rollout of fiber. That was one of his big promises. It was like Trump's infrastructure week. And it never happened because he got mired in other things like healthcare, which are good things to do too. And I was sort of sore because I really was really counting on my students getting jobs laying that fiber. And then mm -hmm. it didn't happen. But, you know, that's always the case. Presidents promise a bunch of stuff, then they can't really do it, then you get mad at them. That's why I think Biden is actually in really good shape because people expect nothing. So he's going to seem like a hero. Whereas Obama, people thought he was going to solve everything. They had him way on a pedestal. And then they were real upset when, of course, he wasn't that great. Anyway. Anyway, um, so this is, uh, this caught my attention because this is the Triton attack um, on a oil processing plant in Saudi Arabia a couple of years ago. This is the one that got me involved with Saudi Arabia. It got the Saudi Arabians so, uh, so worried about Russian attacks that they decided to improve their cybersecurity, among other things, by hiring me to come teach them stuff. But anyway, um, so now the U.S. has put sanctions on them. Russian state nationals, now you can't do business with anybody that does business with that company more than 50% because they uh, make malware that shuts off the safety features to kill people. 
And it would have worked, except uh, something broke. So they caught it before it took effect and killed people in Saudi Arabia. So, you know, it's one of the few uh, cyber attacks that actually kills people. But they're definitely coming. And this it has this funny group, T-N-S-I-I-K-H-M, because it's in that Russian Cyrillic alphabet. And that's the closest they can get to it in, in English. Oh, okay. Okay. Anyway, I'll be talking about it later at the uh, conference at the attack framework. This is why, you know, all these articles about nation state attacks are much more interesting to me now that I put them in the attack framework and I feel like I'm getting some understanding of what good it is to know that. There's even a new book that just came out on attribution and why it's important. So I'm thinking I'll be able to add that in a more formal way to my classes. This instant response class might fork into three classes. I'm, anyway. So then Liz isn't here, so we'll just go back to you, ESXi. Yeah, so thanks to Caitlin. She brought this to uh, my attention and our attention, really, uh, this weekend. There is a way to get VMware ESXi running on a Raspberry Pi. And is it free? It is free. Well, ESXi itself has always been free. And the, and the Pi is powerful enough to run the host? The 8 gigabyte one. What's that? powerful enough. The 8 gigabyte. The, okay. the one that has 8 gigabytes of RAM. So you have uh, ESXi, and then you run something else on top of it, which would be what? Linux? Whatever, whatever VMs you want to run that are uh, ARM-ready. It's got to be ARM-ready. Yeah, that's yeah. what I wondered. Okay. Yeah, it has to be ARM-ready. Yeah, so have you got it uh, doing something yet? Right now, I purchased a 8 gigabyte, because I, I do have a Pi 4, but it's a 2 gigabyte. So that's not Ooh, big enough. That's not big enough. So I, I got an 8. Uh, I already have another... A machine that I'm going to use as vCenter because vCenter is not built for ARM just yet. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. So you still need another system to run vCenter. Uh, so by hopefully by this the end of this week, I'll start assembling this thing and see and see it work. Yeah, well, it's a really good to get practiced using ESXi for the students. Yep, that's a great I, idea. I really like that you can do this on a Pi because that's that is definitely cheaper and more affordable for students to build their own little data center and be able to work with everything outside of NetLab. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that's the whole point of Pi's, affordable hardware for little projects. And then we got Starlink. Oh, okay. Yep. So as AT&T <laughs> abandons the rural customers, yeah. uh, Elon Musk is apparently stepping up uh, with their Starlink program. And so people that don't know what Starlink is, Starlink is basically every two weeks, and as someone who's been doing a lot of space stuff, this is honestly like kind of annoying. Um, Elon Musk has been firing up about 60 new satellites. Really? And these are, lo these are low Earth orbit satellites. There's currently about, there's several thousand up <laughs> currently and, there, and more coming. Um, and they're, they're designed to give internet access, but they're in low Earth orbit. So normally when you have a satellite uh, internet connection, you connect to a geostationary, geostationary satellite, just one. It's far away, so there's a lot of lag. You pay through the nose, and it's um, not a good experience, as we were just talking about. Starlink, what Starlink does is they're sending up thousands and thousands in low Earth orbit. So it's sort of like GPS, only with thousands of satellites. So you'll always have coverage somewhere. Um, and the speeds just came in. Um, and it looks uh, good, like like thirty seven megs. Yeah, so it's it's one hundred and two megabit megabits down, and forty megabits up. But keep in mind, it's still in beta. Yeah. So there's still you know there's not it's not under full load right now, but no, it's it's looking good. It's not as good as like fiber, which is a little disappointing. So we can't like just be like okay, well this is the future. Um, but if you are in rural America, uh, that is an option. The only issue, of course, is that now there's going to be like 10,000 satellites uh, going across, you know, in a, going across our sky all the time. Um, and if you haven't seen pictures of the satellites going across the sky, um, I would recommend going onto YouTube and just searching for a Starlink uh, satellite train and just watch the sky light up with a bunch of these satellites. It is ridiculous but so can you is there any law requiring how many limiting how many satellites you can put up or anything supposedly you do have to get obviously authorization um from who? Before, <laughs> oh from various government agencies but uh he actually owns the sky right i mean who really could say no well the thing is is that 
everything you get put in the sky has to be tracked. Um, and yeah. not only just tracked within the United States, but across uh, all government agencies that have a space agency. Because if you have a satellite in space that could potentially hit another thing, you have to move it out of the way. Yeah. And so it also gets tracked. And I don't know who, what the international organization is off the top of my head that, that tracks all this, but Starlink already got in trouble for not moving one of their satellites out of the way, uh, which is an issue when you're talking about, you know, currently they have like almost like 5,000 satellites yeah. and counting, you know, yeah. you got to make sure they're all moving out of the way and, you know, doing their thing. And like, I think 50 have failed so far, but most of them are betas, but they're low enough. I will say at least they are low enough that they will deorbit. So they have motors and they can't engine so they can move around? Yes. Where Do they have only so much fuel and then it's gone or do they somehow? Uh, yeah, they only have so much fuel uh, to move. Um, obviously, so the way, and I'll, I'll talk about this on November 3rd in your class, yeah, but yeah. Um, uh, so there's, there's two types of, for, of propulsion when you're dealing with these space, um, uh, space satellites. So you, you do have like RCS thrusters, reaction control systems. And the thing about the reaction control systems is that if you know there's going to be a collision way in the future, you only have to nudge it a little bit, right? Right. Because right. you know you're talking about, you know, thousands and thousands of miles, you know, of travel away. Yeah. Um. So you, it doesn't take much to kind of move it into a safe orbit. Um. But the other thing, of course, is that in all these space, especially the low Earth uh, satellites, they have essentially uh, a compasses on them. And so if they want to like realign or, uh, or rotate, they can do that for free, essentially. Oh, okay. Yeah. They, they, gyroscopes. Yeah. And no, not a gyroscope. Um, the, that, those are called reaction wheels and those are used in deep space. But if you're on a low earth orbit satellite, you essentially have a compass, a, a magnet, like a, and so and if you ever notice like a, a compass, if you just float it on water, it'll, it'll spin towards North. Yeah. Because there's no friction in space, you can just put a, essentially a compass in a spacecraft and have a point towards the direction you want by just having a magnet in there. And so the, the magnetic force actually pushes that whole thing around. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, and there's no moving parts to that, which is why it's preferable to reaction wheels in low Earth yeah. orbit. But anyways, we'll go over that in, in your November 3rd class. Then. Well, no, but that, that's really cool stuff. Yeah. And I was, I was thinking there would come a time when you couldn't launch anything without putting like cow catchers on it because you'd have to plow through this pile of rubble to get up there. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, and that's the whole point of them putting it in such low orbit and why they need so many is because if something goes wrong, they're all going to deorbit pretty quickly. So they constantly need to be pushed back up. So is um, Elon Musk going to sell this and make money? Is that the plan? That is the plan. Uh, it is a for-profit. This should have been a, uh, a public uh, thing, especially if they're putting up that many satellites. It should be owned by the public, I think. But as it stands right now, you know, we're this is America. We're super capitalist. So yeah. Elon Musk controls all the satellites, all the 4,000 satellites that are lighting up our sky yeah. every night, transforming the night sky. It's solving the problem created by AT&T leaving it. It, it. it is. And they're also getting subsidies from the government, of course, to fill in those holes in the internet. And so it's like, okay. you know, socialized profits or sorry, socialized losses and private profits you know yeah that's the american way yeah, yeah. <laughs> well anyway it sounds probably cool technology so so i had uh, our last week this was the drama i had a friend who said i should go teach face to face in um qatar and i said oh it sounds good and then when i told woke up and told my friends i said are you out of your mind it's not safe there and he said well i hadn't really thought of that and uh, in fact it's not but anyway this same guy told me to look here this is the reproduction rate. And yesterday, there were like four states down here in the green. This is all the American states. And this is the r naught. how many people you infect per infected person. So one is when it stays even. And above one, you have exponential growth. And below one, it dies off. And now there's only one state down here in Mississippi. So you can see the, the COVID spreading. And you can see for every uh, state, the whole deal. So we were pretty bad. But by April, we kind of got it under control. And now we're sort of, you know, opening and closing in waves to keep it under control. And anyway, it's pretty interesting. You can see the details of the spread here. And uh, hmm. uh, it's, 
it's sort of scientifically interesting. And I expect they're all going to go up like crazy. Like here's Illinois going up. We're beginning the really big surge now. So this is going up every day. And uh, anyway, I thought it's interesting to see the numbers. But uh, yeah, they convinced me not to go to Qatar. There's an official warning saying it's really bad there. Don't do that. And I said, well, now that you mention it, that doesn't make any sense. Somehow it sounded pretty good at four in the morning. But uh, thinking about it later, didn't sound like that good an idea. <laughs> Anyway, so this is. Oh, sure. this is a competitor to Shodan. Oh, Senesis. I didn't know what this was. Yeah, me either. Until I started playing around with it. And, and okay. uh, yeah, it it works very similar to Shodan. Oh. Uh, hasn't been around as long as Shodan. They're high. But, okay. Yeah, oh. a, another tool to add to people's arsenal. So I guess there's no, you have to demo and stuff. I guess you can't like just do it right away like Google. Yeah, you, uh, you can scroll, you should be able to scroll down and be able to see some stuff. Like IP right there, you search port, IPv4. Addresses, ports. Yeah, yeah, but they won't let me do a search. I mean, search IPv4? Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, and then you, uh, you brought up some results and. Oh yeah, so I could now put in like uh, the name of something vulnerable. Oh, look at this. Okay, pops, to, yeah, a whole bunch of good stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, that's cool. Well, I'm glad to see that. Neat. It's uh, another tool to add. Oh, yeah, it is. And then hydrogen fuel. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah. So the, I remember uh, almost a decade ago, people were talking about, what are we going to do with cars? Are we going to make them um, electric or, or add hydrogen fuel cells? And it turns out it looks like we're going with electric. Yeah. Uh, however, that's not really viable for airplanes um, because weight is an issue, of course. So you can't have these giant batteries like you can in a car. Um, so it looks like there's a push to get airplanes uh, using hydrogen instead of jet fuel because currently airlines produce 3% of uh, global uh, carbon emissions, which uh -huh. is you know, not obviously the majority. It's 97% you know, comes from elsewhere, but it's still a sizable amount that we should be reducing. Um, and so it looks like hydro re hydrogen is going to replace um, the you know current jet fuel that we that we use. But uh, there's a there's a lot of issues with one, you know, getting the infrastructure up to date. Like hydrogen is supposedly very hard to transport, uh, especially in the, the the type that you would need to fly. Um, and they're looking at like billions of dollars in order to to make this happen. Uh, but is, this article is, is very interesting in figuring out the, because a lot of times people, I'll often hear people say, yeah, let's just throw up, um, you know, solar panels on roofs and just get rid of all the, the, the carbon emissions everywhere and just have windmills everywhere and it'll be great. Uh, but very, very often I don't hear people talk about the massive infrastructure requirements to make that yeah. stuff happen. And this article talked about that and why it'll take at least until 2035. Uh, to even get that in place. So. Yeah, I saw a good talk about this from a, a government level engineer, and he had a nice graph saying, look, I know you want to have renewable fuel, but here's the total amount of fuel we need. And the only possible source is fossil fuel that can make the quantity we need, unless you massively increase nuclear. And these mm -hmm. other things, you know, it's, it's a, uh, you really have to have a lot of energy. <laughs> Right, you need a lot and you need the infrastructure to support it. You can't just, yeah. you know, replace it. You can't just like throw hydrogen in a jet engine and call and it a day. Like you're done, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, and how do you move the hydrogen? You need to chill it yeah. into a liquid and then you need like cryogenic storage or something. So Right, right. And this talks about how you need, how one of the things they'll have to do is create technology to transport hydrogen on the same uh, trains that they would normally send jet fuel. Yep. And that's, that's something they currently can't do. So, I mean, like I said, there's just a lot of infrastructure that of goes into these big changes. Hydrogen burns really clean, right? All it produces is water. Right. Well, that's nice. Yeah. It is really clean, and we should absolutely do it. Yeah. It's going to cost 25, you know, two, oh, wait, 320 billion. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, that's the Green New Deal thing, and that's why, yeah. you know, that's why I'm, I hope we get Biden and all that, because we got to do it. We, we got to do it. It's going to be expensive and we're going to make sacrifices. It's getting out but, of hand. I mean, you yeah. can't pretend it's not happening anymore. Yeah. yeah. It's just like this coronavirus. If you don't fix it early, it's going to be a lot harder to fix later. Yeah. You know, 
the science denialism has, has gotten so out of hand. You yeah. know, it, it's one thing to be like, well, you know, they theorize that, you know, global warming, whatever is going to happen. But here it is, of course, you know, our state's on fire. We're, yeah. Last night we were talking about the end of the world. And yeah. there's still people out there saying, well, you know, maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> it's, like, it's hitting everywhere. Yeah. It's hitting like all over the nation. I mean, that's why I think, I think this is why I'm sort of hoping Trump will lose because the virus is spreading too. And, you know, yeah. saying, oh, there's nothing to see here. It's just getting harder and harder to believe, you know? Yeah, but I mean, there's still people just in the, in the, just hit in the face with all this evidence of, you know, the coronavirus is real. It is a threat yeah. and people are dying and people are still like, it's a hoax. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I what? know. <laughs> well, I think what I heard is that Trump lost a lot of support when he got it. They say, hey, wait a minute. That's not right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He gets it. That kind of fouls up that narrative. <laughs> yep. Anyway, well, I hope so. Anyway, and then, uh, so Microsoft is on the privacy bandwagon again. This has always been their big thing. For the last 10 years, Microsoft loves to push privacy because they get to have, have the moral high ground. We're Microsoft. We don't spy on you like that nasty Google. You should go punish Google. So anyway, they, um, they have an angry self-righteous blog where they have figured out that America doesn't have enough privacy protection because of course, privacy protections would hurt Google and not them. <laughs> So anyway, um, but you know, they are correct, by the way, that America really lacks privacy protection. And uh, a large number of people, if you survey them, say they're very nervous about what happens to the information on the internet and uh, we need better privacy protection. And it ultimately is responsible for all this fake news and everything. The fact that they can get all your demographic information and then use it to target you with careful misinformation to make you not vote. You know? so, so we'll see what comes of it. And Microsoft is the good guy in this battle which is kind of a new and an unfamiliar place for them to have. Hmm. Microsoft is good on the security community too, which is, you know, yeah. in the past eight years they've reformed. They used to be the notorious laughing stock and they reformed. And now they really try hard to be secure. So, you know. Because they need those government contracts. Yeah. Well, and also, <laughs> also, I remember what got them was back in the days of like the early days of Windows XP, people were actually canceling their internet service and trying to switch to something else because Windows didn't work. It would just get totally infected and you have alligators dancing on the screen and porn popping up. And they, they said, that's when Bill Gates said, all right, we have to start getting serious about security. This is getting out of hand. <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's the latest thing there. All right, any more comments? No, I think, I think we should go over Liz's articles. Well, maybe we should, I don't know much about, oh, Among Us, you should tell us about Among Us. <laughs> uh, hello. Hey! Oh, yeah. oh, good. We're right here, just in time. We were. Yeah, we, we, I just I got caught in a cloud of toxic super fun dust. Okay. Well, I'm glad you made it. You're just a, trying to figure out what to do about your articles. So tell us about your articles. Uh, yeah. So I heard all the cool kids are playing this game called Among Us. I've heard that too. Uh, and uh, in what seems to be the new uh, mo, uh, just like happened with Minecraft. Uh, it's after AOC uh, played and, and everybody was like, oh, AOC is a real human who plays video games. Yep. Uh, the, within like a week or two, uh, the game got attacked and flooded by uh, Trump spam bots. <laughs> oh, yeah, I see. Trump 2020. Well, there you go. <laughs> Just for the record, I had nothing to do with this. So did they figure out what happened? I mean, do they have an insecure API or something? Yes, uh, they do have an insecure API. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, yeah, and they're, they're aware of it, and they're trying to make sure that everything's okay. Now, you know, Caitlin, when you said, I didn't do it, and then your next, you, you know, I believe you just based on content alone, but when your <laughs> next uh, sentence is, they do have an insecure API, it just, you know, makes a person wonder. I, yeah, the first thing I did when I played Among Us was like, I was like, this is a flash game, pretty much. And then I started uh, uh, capturing packets and looking at how it worked. And, yeah. Of course. That's often more fun than the actual game, yeah. is hacking the game. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And then uh, Chrome, all right. Oh, Chrome does not erase the data. No, only for, it's interesting, they actually have exceptions for uh, Google and YouTube. Um, <laughs> And they didn't really tell people. They just left that in there, which is yeah. great because 
uh, just allows Google to keep uh, collecting data on you and tracking you as you uh, move about the internet. You know, they are not under antitrust investigation right now, aren't they? This yeah. is not going to be a good look for them. It's interesting because I'm working on a research study right now about browser tracking and privacy. And um, this is uh, this is a very very timely story for me. It is. It is. I mean, it's a it's a hot issue. We really need to, to improve that. Yeah. And then you got another one here, Bill. Oh, okay. Oh, on the internet, so, they actually have the internet kill switch. That's what I said. I kind of freaked out when I read this because I didn't know it was a thing in the first place. But under it's Obama, they talked about it, but I thought it never happened. It's under it. It didn't ever happen, but it, oh. it he apparently has the power to do that under this obscure 1930s law that was intended to uh, shut down uh, radio. <laughs> um, but that has that you know that. that that is a, a very vague uh, definition um, of, of wireless communications. And it's obvious to us that what they meant by that was radio, but um, that applies to uh, internet as well. So let's hope this passes because uh, we really don't, we really don't want to be China like that. No, I don't think so. And I remember at the time, you know, under Obama, the issue was that it's not technically possible. Other countries force you to go through the official national ISP. In America, you couldn't turn it off. So you'd have to force all the ISPs to add that feature. And that was the point at that time. Because even if the president ordered you to shut off the internet, you couldn't do it. Yeah, well, I mean, and the thing is, is like if you're in an emergency, isn't the internet kind of important? Well, you know, the point is for authoritarian countries. And of course, in, World War, in the World War, they were thinking of like enemy agents spreading disinformation through it, which is kind of like what Facebook is now. We're kind of in a situation where enemy nations are spreading disinformation through the internet, harming us. Turning off the internet doesn't seem like the wisest response, but it's actually a, a current concern. I also kind of wonder, though, how this would even apply to stuff like ham radio, because you can't really shut down the hams either. I mean, you can, you, the FCC can tell you no, no, no uh, transmission, but, you know, I, you can't really enforce that very, very well. Yeah, you'd have to design the whole system to go through one central choke point, which is what they do, not with radio, with the internet in other countries. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. Unless uh, they jam the airwaves. Yeah. That's true. But that, that's true. Yeah. All right. I suppose well, it's right. possible. Um, I, I, speaking of which, I there was one of Caitlin's articles, which... Uh, really, really surprised me. And it was actually your first article about uh, the DSL phase out, which yeah. I didn't know that was a thing. And uh, also, um, it's not just poor rural users. That's actually the only, um, I have two options where I am, I am right now with my office. Uh, I can get satellite internet, which is horrendous. Um, or I can get AT&T and T DSL, um, an extremely overpriced AT&T DSL package, and that's it. There's no fiber, there's no cable. So, and I mean, I could, and I can see a San Francisco from the parking lot. So it's not like this is exactly rural. So you need Elon Musk to put up another thousand satellites for you. Yeah, maybe so. I mean, some fiber would be nice too, but I'm not holding my breath. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, the cable companies are making sure you're not getting fiber anytime soon. This. this is just insane. I mean, my parents live out in the country in the Midwest, and that's all they can get is, is kind of crappy DSL. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, it's, it's, I don't even understand how this is going to work because we just don't have the infrastructure to support it. So, well, it, we, we, you kind of missed the discussion, but and the thing that, that's most disappointing is that it, this isn't like a planned thing where they're going like, to improve the infrastructure and say, okay, we're moving you off of DSL, the fiber or anything. They're just like, we're just not making enough money off these poor rural areas. Goodbye. Yeah. That's capitalism. That's what's yeah. supposed to happen. <laughs> well, we need, we need to have a, 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 a state or federal option ISP, you know, where we can well, guarantee people get, you know, internet access, but 
Or we we can't the, even guarantee medical access. You, so can. you have the invisible hand of Adam Smith and a competitor like Elon Musk swoops in and, and makes another commercial product. Utah, well, surprisingly, Utah is on this. They've managed to implement a really pretty impressive fiber infrastructure in their state. And I mean, even reaching to really far corners. And um, I'm, I was I was really surprised to learn that, but I was also really impressed because, um, you know, they're they're, you know, sort of sort of uh, what's the best way to put this? Um, they're, I, they're they're pretty rural in a lot of ways. I guess I'll say it that way. Uh, and and I, it was unexpected, but it's it's something that we need to follow that example. Um, I think in the rest of the country because. You know, this is especially now with so many people having to go to school online. Um, stuff, stuff like this is just going to deepen the digital divide. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So. Yeah. I have several students that have just vanished because they don't have a good enough way to get online. Yeah. That's why there's some pressure for somebody to like open up the computer labs next semester and maybe we'll find some way to do that. All right. Any other comments? Well, I'm going to stop the recording. This is great.